Oh, baby girl. Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Today on episode 297, I am very lucky, privileged to have a Dave Gallagher on the podcast. He is hmm, motivational speaker, mind and optimal performance coach, as well as a cognitive explorer. Hmm. <laughs> How are you today, sir? How are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. It's a lovely evening and uh, perfect for having a Good old chinwag about all these things. Yeah, you are, how can I say? Now, you're a very interesting cat, <laughs> to say the least. Because what takes someone who works for, say, a company like Unilever, quite straight-laced and, like, yes, slowly taking over the world, one of the, like, famous five or six, <laughs> which control our lives and destiny, to, like, yeah, be jumping off mountains and like yeah exploring and like going all around the world pushing yourself to the extreme well yeah i mean my life's been very circuitous uh from sort of you know fairly low-key beginnings and then as you said working in a big multinational company mm. uh, which was formative in itself um yeah i had a career in the kind of consumer goods industry um, and then I launched myself from that company, uh, I'm no longer there, into what I do now as a cognitive explorer, which is basically, I call myself an adventure psychologist, or more, perhaps more precisely, an adventure neuropsychologist, and I can get into that and into terminology in due course. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've always been adventurous in one way or another, but it took a bit of as life takes us off in different directions, it sometimes takes a while to really get to where you want to be and what you want to do. And sometimes it can take 20 years. Um, and that's where I come in as a, a bit of a coach as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I went on this kind of journey through semi-conventional career, mm -hmm. but with a psychological background and, and a real burning uh, desire to understand what kind of gets people going? What what kind of gets people fired up and purposeful? And adventure is where that's at. That's that's where I come in. So uh, you know, doing adventures, having an adventurous kind of mindset is key, and that's what I promote. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, I, we can get into the journey. I don't know where to start. Maybe you want to guide me in that <laughs> direction of questioning. Yeah, because like this is the thing with regards to say working for Unilever and the stuff you were doing for them, it's also about motivating people and finding those sort of key like trigger points. But yeah. uh, there is the sort of jump from that to like, okay, what makes people take action and like get that sort of adventurous spark? Because it lives within all of us, I believe. But it sort of manifests in different ways. Some of us are, well, the very like small groups are off traveling around the world, discovering new countries, sailing boats by themselves. Uh, you know what I mean? Really pushing themselves. And yeah. other people are just moving uh, to a different city and experiencing life that way. Yeah. Well, uh, well, adventure is a broad spectrum, isn't it? And yeah, like, like you say, I mean, to, to one person, adventure is just getting out of the house and doing something a bit different, you mm. know, a local park or or trying a new hobby. But to other people, it's it's a real, you know, explorers, pioneers, Ranald Fiennes type. <laughs> type. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they push it to the next level. And, and that's what, I mean, as a psychologist, that's what's fascinating to kind of understand, you know, what is the, what does that spectrum mean to different people and what's kind of going on under the hood so I really try to, to probe that. Um, and, you know, like you've mentioned, my career in consumer goods, mm. a lot of people kind of wonder, well, where does that, is that something you did in the past? Is that nothing to do with what you do now? But actually, I think it was a very formative time for me because I was trying to understand what drives people in everyday life to get through the daily grind, mm -hmm. you know, using products, um, doing kind of day-to-day -day chores, and, and looking at people in lots of different markets, lots of different countries and different cultures and the, the different kind of grains that people have, depending on where they live and what their the demands on their time are. 
And there's something about understanding what are the things which people have to do day to day, mm -hmm. uh, hold them back, but which which take all their time and their priorities, and what would they rather be doing in a lot of cases. So a lot of product development. I mean, I won't go into too much detail about the past and, and work now because we want to talk about uh, uh, talk about adventure, don't we? Um, but a lot of what we want to do in life, we're kind of constrained by the day-to-day -day grudge and the day-to-day -day grind. And uh, that's kind of what I was looking at in my, my career, if you like, sort of how can we help people make the most of their time so they're not spending all their time doing the mundane chores because everyone has aspirations. And that's a great kind of formative time to then eventually, like I'm now, help people use that time productively to do the things they really want to do and the adventurous type of things. So let me ask you this. What was the thing what snapped you out of your, well, at the time, mundane? Yeah. Something, well, <laughs> <laughs> well the, the funny thing is, I mean, it might sound mundane and maybe that's the way I've, I've just pitched that. But actually my, my life in my career was pretty exciting when, when I, you know, there was exciting opportunities uh, because I was working for a big business and also I was traveling the world, observing people in different countries and what, what are their daily lives about? And, you know, we can live in a certain part of the world and have a, have a certain idea of what people's lives are about. But until you go into other places and see, well, you don't have the same infrastructure in this country or you don't have the same kind of, um, you know, things in, in this other country which which drive your time and, and the things you're doing. So going out into these different places and seeing how people live in every kind of realm was, was really interesting and exciting. And I got to travel to some quite exotic places within that and understand, you know, the, the mundane, if you like, uh, in different different places. Mm -hmm. But, like, this is the thing. Like, okay, the mundane, I would always say, as most things, is always on the spectrum. And something which you like, oh, I was traveling to all these places, exciting opportunities and everything like this. To, like, look, for someone who sits on the outside, yes, you're traveling here, there, and everywhere. But if there is, let's just say a niche which is just out of reach, which I, from what you were doing to what you're doing now, there must, I, I imagine there must have been, correct me if I'm wrong, but like what made you sort of like, oh, you know what, I need to take this new path and like That's scratch right. that itch. Yeah, well, I, I was trying to scratch the itch partially, I suppose, to do it and answer that. So while I was doing that work and mm. traveling, places, I was also tagging on, adventurous experiences because you know if you're going somewhere you've got to experience it more than just in the working context you've got to put a bit more time getting to know the the area and what possibilities are there so I did go on some quite exciting trips while out there which then got me fired up to think well how can I do this more <laughs> how can I do this more full time uh, and to launch from that kind of mundane if you like in an exotic place to doing the adventures in the exotic place so like anything, I mean, a career, you, you can do quite a lot in 20 years. Uh, and gradually you find ways to to channel your, your interests into the area and, and take that bold leap, I guess. And, and that's something I talk about as a coach, as a motivational type person, how you use what you've already done to then launch. But it's a bold step you've got to take. And that's, that's often where we're held back by security and stability, aren't we? But sometimes life throws a curveball and things change in our personal lives and our professional lives and we we kind of get that crossroads and I guess that's where I came to about four or five years ago where I was ready to make that jump but didn't quite have the impetus until various life circumstances kind of gave me that little nudge in that direction but you know I, I'm a real believer and you put in all that kind of groundwork you have have a, a desire and a, a goal of where you're going mm. and it's kind of there in the background until the circumstances and, and the life opportunities kind of give you that little nudge and then you just go. But, you know, it's it's interesting because I deal with extreme sports people, people who base jump, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and I'm looking at how what is the mentality behind that, and it's interesting. There's many metaphors around this, but the bass drum is literally leaping into the unknown, and that's a, obviously a metaphor in life. But you don't leap into the unknown without having a bit of a background and a, an experience and a, a sense of why you're going to leap into that unknown. It's not just a, you know, you're not a lemming. You're not just jumping off the cliff. <laughs> uh, at least I hope not. Yeah. Yeah, because like this is the thing when you say like mention comfort, like basically many of us just live in that sort of realm of comfort. Yeah. Like either it comes down to sort of personal responsibilities, which might be there, like with regards to family, kids, everything like that. And they go, I can't really do anything too daring, too bold or anything like that. But uh, much of the times when it's just people who don't have their, those type of responsibilities, yeah. it's, how can I say, I, saying it's fear, like just based on fear, eh, it's a little bit, that will be a little bit too easy. Yeah. Um, it might be a factor, but I don't think it's the overall factor. I think it sometimes comes down to not a lot of people know who they truly are and, yeah. and trying to f- figure that out takes a lot of time, work and effort. And I don't, I think that's where most people fall down, even like on a regular basis. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, finding your purpose is it's not an easy thing. And it can be quite hard work and it can be quite a soul searching thing. Mm. And again, it can, it can rely on putting yourself out there and taking risks. Um, but, you know, I mean, purpose kind of comes at the end of a process of, of looking at what you're interested in and what you're curious about and then building that into passion and, and putting energy in. Mm. So it's a, it can be quite a long thing. And it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, and it's like, you know, anything worthwhile will take a bit of heartache along the way, a bit of life gets in the way. And it's again, it's how you respond to to that. And then, you know, you take control of, of your own destiny. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not an easy process. So, like, with regards to it not being an easy process, like, for yourself, what would you say was one of the sort of more sort of challenging times for you going through this process? Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there was some personal stuff in my life a, a few years ago, and that was difficult. And there's, you know, I won't go into details on that, but there comes a time sometimes, and maybe it's as you approach a certain time of life as well. And like you talked about that when we're, we were talking off air at the start, you know, your twenties, thirties, and so on, and then you get into some more middle age, <laughs> whatever that is, and you, you kind of look at well, your life. Pup, sir, a mere pup. <laughs> exactly. And then, yeah, I mean, you know, I, you kind of, there's an expectation. Should I be this? Should I be that? People used to tell me in the gym, oh, wait till you get to your, to, to my age, you'll slow down. You won't be able to do half the things you'll be. And I said, oh, how old are you? Uh, he was 42. I said, all right, well, I'm 39. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, three years, there's a lot going to happen. <laughs> then, yeah, I mean, so I guess I was going into that if you like, middle age and the uncertainty of what that means. And then some personal stuff happens and then you kind of get a bit of a crossroads in where your job and career is going. And I don't know what it was specifically, but a combination of factors. And then sometimes you're in a bit of a low phase and you have that in the back of your mind. Well, what is it I should be doing? All these things I've tried to do in the past. I don't know. Something just clicked in me and an opportunity started opening up. And I think that's a mindset thing as well. You know, when you open up your mindset to possibilities, which which might sound quite abstract, but, you know, you, when, when you're at a low point, sometimes you, it's almost like, well, what the hell? What can happen? It, you know, what can go worse? <laughs> what can go wrong? Everything's kind of gone wrong. <laughs> so let's put ourselves out there. And, and that's it. It's that bold step forward. Um, and I found uh, kind of a serendipitous, a couple of key figures in my life coved into view round about this period when I was at this crossroads. Um, we talked about base jumping. So that was one set of people just coved into my my sphere. And another set of people I'll, I'll come on to in, in a minute. Um, so I was um, 
I, I was again being very adventurous into climbing into photography. Mm. And I started to do some climbing related photography. So I was hanging off ropes and taking pictures of climbers. And then I was at this particular place, not far from where I live in North Wales, uh, and saw some guys who were preparing to base jump in a place which I never would have thought it was possible to base jump. I assumed that base jumping only took place in far off places in the Alps, in America, you know, places where there's massive kind of cliffs and walls. Mm. And this much smaller sort of area closer to my home. And I didn't realise they were base jumping at the time until I wandered up and asked them if they were okay, if they were lost, <laughs> you know, what were they doing there? Kind of thing. And when I found out they were about to jump off the cliff, I, I nipped back to the car and got my camera. I said, oh, just hang on a moment. Just don't go yet. I need to take a picture of this. Um, and, and that set in, chain, in motion the chain of events where I became part of the, the extreme sports and base jumping community in the UK. I ended up publishing pictures in the press, writing magazine articles about this and, and taking some of that um, psychological interest and research mm. in that direction, which was kind of, I guess, bubbling away in the back of my mind. But until now, I've not had that opportunity to go out of the, the consumer side of things in my nine, nine to five job and into the more adventurous community of consumers, because everyone's a consumer at some level. So, yeah, that, that set in motion a, a complete chain of, of events where I suddenly became this base jumping psychologist or a psychologist studying base jumpers and eventually did a base jump myself as well. And, again, I know I, I've talked about this with other people before, about community and connection. Mm. And how sometimes when you need to change direction or get a momentum to actually go in a different direction to maybe what you've done before, it's sometimes finding that you become part of a community, a connection with with wider uh, people who do these sorts of things, and it opens up your mindset to uh, you know embracing off the wall experiences, literally off the wall, jumping off the wall, <laughs> off the cliff. <laughs> it's like, yes, no, I yeah, think... it, it yeah. Things kind of build momentum from there. Uh, and round about the same time, I also ended up um, meeting some people who did sailing, so went out to sea. And it wasn't a sort of run of the mill, just pottering about for the day of sailing. This was proper sea voyages around the UK. And I ended up going out to sea with a, a chap I'd only met a couple of weeks before. I was, I was actually, it was a life coaching session I'd decided to go to, funny enough. And I think you'll find a lot of coaches, maybe, I wouldn't say they had the same kind of progression into it, but they, you know, they, they will go to a coach or you'll get more familiar with coaching and what it's about. And then you'll carry on in that coaching space. Well, I met someone who was a coach and then in discussions with, with him, it became evident he was into adventure and sailing and going to sea. And he was very interested in the combination of psychology and sailing. And there was me interested in psychology and mountains and adventure and et cetera. So we started hatching plans to actually not to do life coaching together. I'd kind of, you know, just dip my toe in the water, but to actually do things together going forward, bringing other people into this community uh, and do sailing and doing these kind of mad epic voyages around the UK, um, which wasn't what I was quite expecting, it has to be said, but it was pretty awesome, yeah. You know, until you've, with only a day or two sailing expertise, you've, you've been thrown in on midnight watch and you've got the boat on its side and you're steering the helm and you're flying along with the wind in the sails, looking at the stars while everyone else is asleep. That's quite a formative sort of experience. Um, and it opens you up to that kind of possibility, oh, I never thought I could do this sort of thing. Um, and here I am doing it and I'm loving it and let's have more of it. <laughs> My God. No, like this is I, it's one of those things where I think people always sort of fall into it, like being able to see op, like we see opportunities and like we see pitfalls everywhere. But yeah. more times than not, you're either in one mode or the other. I don't see I, I've, well, I don't often see people which like go, there's a pitfall here and an opportunity. It's like one or the other it's like binary just, just can't get out of it but 
for yourself, like just like from <laughs> seeing a couple of people like, like okay, you must be lost. No, <laughs> we're going to uh, take the quick way off this cliff. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you running back uh, going, I need to grab my camera so I can take a picture of you. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's one of those things when all of a sudden, you know, when someone goes, yeah, have you seen a yellow beetle car? And you're like, oh, I haven't seen one of those for ages. And all of a sudden, they start appearing left, right, and center. They've always been there. It's just a case of that's it. Turned on to it. Yeah, yeah. We it's it's paying attention. And funny enough, in my previous job, I was a specialist in what people pay attention to. Mm. And that was what I was employed to look at in terms of products and getting products on shelves. Well, you know, if you're going to sell, if the marketing side, if you're going to sell something, it's great if you've got a funky product, which is different than everything else. But if it's not in the right place on the shelf, if people don't see it because they're expecting to see something completely different, mm. sometimes you can fall foul of that until it's kind of brought into your consciousness of this is the sort of product which is new on the shelf. This is what you can do, all these things, blah, blah, blah. So I was, I guess I was a specialist in attention and that, set me into looking into the psychology of attention in in more adventurous opportunities uh, and adventurous situations because again once you have that adventurous kind of mindset you, you're opening up the possibility to seeing opportunities to do things and that might be at an unconscious level which i suspect was operating on that day when i saw these guys base jumping and then sort of took the opportunity so sometimes it's kind of like you've got to be almost in a receptive state and that might be because you're at the the bottom of the you know the the trough in that point part of your life. Because sometimes when we're happy, we're we're kind of fixated on what we're doing and everything's fine and we don't see other things because we don't need to see other opportunities, do we? So I think it's sometimes turning that that it's kind of reverse psychology, isn't it? When you're feeling really low, it's kind of sometimes you can open up your your vision because. You know, yes, you're not not in a good place. You're not you're stuck in the the rut, and you're sort of bored with the rut. Uh, you know, so sometimes that can spark that that change. I would say also if you're facing some form of trauma as well, yeah. that's always that helps. Well, that kicks things in. Uh, what I'm curious about because, like, yes, the sort of if you're a bass drum jumper like extreme sailor or like, yeah, you're climbing a mountain. Would you say there is like, there is a sort of core tenant to all three of those, which leads to that sort of extreme or is it a very sort of different vein in whatever you might be doing? Yeah. It's funny. It's a good question because I've been asking myself that and asking the question more generally for a long time. Now what's what I think is quite I find that I fit in with a lot of these different communities because I do all these type of things myself. Yeah. Whereas you do get a lot of people are very in their own niche community. Um, and to kind of answer your question in, in a slightly roundabout way. So I hang about with bass jumpers. I've hung around with climbers, sailors, scuba divers. And, you know, we're talking quite extreme people in, in each of those domains. And, and I have often find that people are very obsessive about their activity and it's almost the be all and end all of what they do not 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 in terms of their whole life but it's their passion and that's what they do and if they've got a saturday or a sunday where they're they're given free time maybe by their their family's time gives them a, a day off or whatever to do their their passion they will focus on that thing and and i've often i like to hybridize things so you I do have pictures of me abseiling with diving gear into waterfalls and all this kind of stuff because I like to do things a bit differently. And and often I, I try to get people interested from one community in doing that thing in a different context. Mm -hmm. And that might be scuba divers going up a mountain because there's an interesting lake up the mountain. Let's go up there. No, we don't do that. We're, we're scuba divers. We're not mountain climbers <laughs> or vice versa. You know. So often I find that people kind of get their passion and their obsession and their focus on one of these extreme type of activities and they that's what they do and then other people you know will do their other thing now 
the question is, is there a common kind of character trait, I guess, which maybe uh, speaks to your question, which defines that the same person has the same kind of mental attitude, but they have to do a specific sport in one direction or the other. Mm. And that may be true to an extent, and that's what my research tries to to identify those mechanisms in the brain. And I'll, I'll explain a bit in a, in a short while about how that's, I think that's useful for anyone in any sphere of life to deal with stress. Mm. But I do find some people are very, they have, everyone has their own fears and their own limitations. And some people push their fear in a certain direction, mm. be that miss jumping or whatever, but they won't necessarily want to do, I don't know, underwater stuff. So you do get people will have certain limitations and certain limiting beliefs in, in other areas. So I know people who can jump off a cliff, but they are terrified of being underground or in confined spaces. Or, you know, people who are good at scuba diving, but ter- terrified of heights. Mm. So it, it's a quite a complex <laughs> question. It's something I'm trying to answer. And I haven't, haven't answered your question in a nice, clear-cut way. Well, I think there's bits and bobs within that. Yeah, I was yeah, I was curious because I'm not 100 percent sure there is a real clear cut way it can be answered because the sort of uh risk appetite for risk it's going like as you mentioned just now, someone who can jump off a cliff would totally panic if they were underground or if they were in a different situation. So like it's one of those things where I always like try to work out like okay. When you see those guys in the squirrel suits going along, like like going okay, they're going at a crazy speed, and you think you just do one twitch wrong, that's it, it's game over. Mm-hmm. But they're just perfectly fine with it, yeah. and like being able to control that sort of appetite of risk is, I would I would say it's. A little bit alien to me because I haven't done anything like that, and I've, I'm not too sure like when like how that really sometimes fits in with sort of like society as a whole. Because if like extreme sports, police officers fire like fire people, like you know what I mean, it's there is a crazy spectrum out there, and like it must cross over somewhere in society where yeah need it. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of points on that. I mean, you mentioned you said control and risk in the same sentence, and actually, mm. that is definitely a, a key facet of the people I experience and who I study and who I associate with. Mm. It's not a, a crazy jump off the cliff with like, oh, there's a cliff, there. let's go and jump off it. Hey, <laughs> there's a controlled risk side of it, and it's a progressive control and a lot of base jumpers i know and people who jump off in those type of wingsuits mm. they're very calculated they're very um working out the conditions they're weighing up what they've done before how what they're doing now fits within the safe margins or the relatively safe margins of what they've done before and they will calculate they'll, they'll have lasers little devices which uh, you can lean over the edge of the cliff and you can calculate through a laser device how far certain distances are the angles the glide ratios of their equipment uh the the prevailing conditions of the wind and the and the terrain and how that funnels around and the, the air flow and they take into account all of that because at the end of the day they are not suicidal they're not total lunatics they've often got families of their own and you know and partners and, and all that kind of stuff and they like to control that risk they, they want to be having fun as well and yes there's a, a twitching <laughs> twitchy moment of doing that <laughs> but ultimately anything that any of us do which which we really are passionate about and it may be a thrill we don't want to go too far such that we hate every moment of that of doing it and then we're relieved to have got over it at the end. We want to be at that kind of sweet spot where, you know, we're within our limits or, or we're on the edge of our limits and we're in control, but there's a total thrill. And we're kind of, that, that's kind of the optimal zone in a way of something you might call the flow state, which mm. people talk about. So, and then to come back to what you said about everyday life, well, my research, and I, I really 
kind of pursue this, that we can learn something from that controlled risk, from that mindset and mentality, and we can apply that into everyday life um, in more mundane settings. So dealing with stress, and this is what I talk about a lot. So what could be more stressful than st- being stood on the edge of a cliff knowing that if you get it wrong, you're dead? <laughs> Well, that mentality and the mindset and what's going on in the brain and the measures that I can actually take in situ are very relevant to dealing with stress in everyday life. And it's it all comes out of the fight or flight response, which, you know, a lot of people are familiar with this fight or flight response where your kind of brain shuts down, you've got this instinctive mode and you're, you're completely tense. Um, but understanding the mechanisms that are going on in the mind and body when that fight or flight kicks in and having some psychological strategies weighing up risk weighing up what you've done before what are the conditions in the outside environment what what are the calculations of what what could happen what couldn't happen depending on the course of action all this kind of mentality can also be employed in everyday life to to make business decisions to make decisions in your personal life you know where you're weighing all this up i mean it's it's a, a metaphor as well but i help people understand the stress response and even how to measure it with things like heart rate monitors and what you can do with that data and just having a bit more of that understanding the mechanism you can start to you know put psychological strategies into place and 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 manage your own risk and it's not the same as the squirrel suit but there's things you can bring home from that no it's not the same as you're right it's not the same as a squirrel suit but this is the thing i would say if you're caught, really caught up in that sort of, uh, I would say, anxiety tangle, yeah. like, let's just say, and you can't sort of pull on that sort of key thread to sort of like go, okay, I can make a decision now because, okay, you've weighed up, you like you're weighing up every single risk there is. And I think this is where a number of people sometimes get trapped themselves, like going, okay, this, that, this, that, this all lead into this like realm of procrastination putting off that choice that decision to like well to a point where okay you've got no choice now and you've got to leap and that leap might be if you're lucky fingers crossed and everything lines up might yeah. be the perfect time yeah. but more times than not it's n- not the right time because yeah. it's been overanalyzed and yeah. 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 And it's, there's no easy answer to that, but I mean, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to talk about be cliched about things, but things like mindfulness, mm. breathing, stress control techniques are, are all very useful to help us sort of keep the parts of the brain online which can make can see the opportunities and make the right decisions and and be creative in in finding solutions to the the problem we're in and the the trouble is and this is where i kind of plug the brain side of my research Mm. parts of the brain which become overactive when we're stressed when we're anxious when there's there's all these pressures on us and and our kind of reaction is to almost like you say overanalyze get stuck in that loop of thinking and and i kind of use the analogy of scrolling you know what do we do when we're having some downtime we pick up i don't know instagram scroll through all these these blooming uh, stories and people having accidents or people doing stupid things and and it's like what we're doing 20 minutes have gone by and it's funny that's a, that's a real analogy for what goes on in the brain and the parts of the brain which get stuck in this loop of rumination something it's it's actually called the default mode network yeah so there's actually a terminology for this uh, measured in brain scanners when people are in these kind of stuck loops there's sets of the brain parts of the brain which talk to each other and get connected and they call it the default mode and it's effectively it's the mode that your brain goes into when it's not focused on a productive task on getting jobs done which need to be done or following your goals and and we get stuck in this loop. And the interesting thing is, when we look at things like mindfulness, meditation, or even certain ways of breathing, which can slow your breathing down and activate the calming side of, of the system, which we've evolved to have, mm-hmm. so the, these techniques and ideas can are shown in brain scanners to turn down these parts of the brain which get stuck in these loops. And these loops 
uh, th this default mode is all to do with self and the, the identity and the self-related processes. So anything to do with what's happening to me, what's happened to me in the past, what might happen to me in the future, blah, blah, what do other people think of me? Oh, I'm no good. This kind of self-limiting voice. That's these these parts of the brain which are sort of overactive. And, and techniques such as meditation, such as mindfulness, done in a kind of correct and, and directed way, can turn down this, this inner voice. And what that can help us do, it, it makes us calmer, but it, it helps the the parts of the brain kick in, which are good at starting to see possibilities to get out of this situation. You know, and that's it all also goes back to what I said before about starting to be open to opportunities and see things in the outside world and see the yellow beetle car like you mentioned earlier on. And this this is kind of how the brain's working. And and this is what's fascinating in the type of research to do, because we're looking at these type of situations people are in and then trying to identify the brain patterns and then look at techniques which can help you turn down almost like it's a physical thing, like you're turning down a you're turning a switch to turn this part of the brain off to get the part of the brain up and running that's just going to help you get to to do the things that you want to do and and i promote the virtues of adventure getting in the outside world getting in the outdoors because the outside world as in the great outdoors is is there is nature's kind of medicine cabinet if you like it we've evolved to operate more optimally in nature and doing more adventurous things, which which give us a challenge, you know. So so my my kind of approach is to take people out of the the stuck in the rut sort of uh, you know situation and get them in the outdoors, getting just just out of the context they're normally in. And sometimes that perspective is enough to to get out of those habits of thinking and you know. And and this is work I do with charities as well, and you know people like homeless people and. Uh, former substance abusers, getting them out into the outdoors and giving them that direction and finding that passion and purpose within themselves can can try and break these these patterns of thought. Yeah, like this is the thing. I'll, 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 here I am and here you are. We're sitting quite comfortably in our homes at this present time having this conversation. Uh, but more times than not, people are like, yeah, but sitting down, watching TV, having like that sort of moment of relaxation. But then it's like working in the office and doing that. They're like, it's a very sort of controlled, like paint by numbers. Like, yeah, repeat, repeat, repeat. Being outdoors, being like going outside and yeah, just experiencing that. There's many a times you have no idea what's going to come around the corner. So it makes you sort of, I would imagine, operate on a slightly different level. It might not be totally aware of it. It might be a very subconscious thing. But yeah, subtle enough, but it activates something much more differently in mm -hmm. like, the individual as a whole, you know? absolutely yeah i mean and it's it's easy for me to sit here and say oh you should go outdoors you should do this you should yeah. do with and and not everyone knows where to start and it, it is easier to put your feet up watch netflix and sometimes that's what you need um you know then argue well scrolling through instagram is almost certainly not not what you need for <laughs> neurobiological reasons where it's it, it, it's it's like I say, I'm enlightening it and liking it to that set of regions in the brain which are stuck in that scrolling loop. Instagram's the perfect example of of you're basically doing that on a phone to what you'd be doing in your head, you know. So it does. That's why I kind of promote myself to to spread the message that getting outdoors is great for you with some of this understanding of the the underlying brain and psychological kind of you know insights with that and and also sometimes you need someone such as someone who can guide you in the outdoors so people know about coaching they know they know to go to life coaches there's not so many people although there are people like myself who take people into the outdoors to do it but sometimes it's that powerful message of saying well there are people like me who can take you out into the outdoors mm. and get that change of perspective and talk a bit about this these these insights from what's going on in the brain and the mind because i i, I kind of Talk of it a bit like a, a, me a mechanic, you know. So what's what can be more stressful than you're driving to work, doing your nine to five, you're in that 
zone of comfort, you know exactly what's happening, driving back and forth. Then you have a flat tyre or something goes wrong with the engine and like, oh, all of a sudden my car doesn't drive the way it used to. I've now got to think about this. And now there's the anxiety of, well, what's wrong with the car? Well, it's not going anywhere till I take it to the garage. Well, if I take the garage, I'm going to get fleeced by the mechanic because you take the garage and suddenly they find everything's wrong with the car and it's going to cost you hundreds of pounds and you don't trust. Do you trust them that they know that they're not just fleecing you? So all of a sudden you're trying to kind of figure out, I don't know anything about the engine. What if I knew a little bit about the engine to keep it maintained? Mm. Or if I knew a little bit more about the engine, this part works with that part. Ah, and I've done this with my own vehicle, actually, through a, a series of trial and error. My my um, van, which I go out into the wild with, is is stopped working. And then I figured out that there's something in the engine, which if I just tighten this nut here, it keeps the engine ticking over. Ah, right, now I've learned a little bit about my own engine. I need to keep that tweaked. Now I can actually, I don't have the anxiety about having to take it to the garage every time there's a problem. And I see this as a useful analogy for understanding some of what I'm talking about. When you start understanding a bit of how the brain works, or someone like myself can tell you about how the brain works, yeah. and how this relates to these uh, you know, positive mindset sort of things, which can help you get out of a, a ruminating sort of cycle and into a more focused state um, it, it then starts to alleviate a bit of that anxiety because it's giving you some empowerment mm -hmm. uh, to, to take control of your own engine, if you like, and, and optimise it to do what you want, uh, you know, out in the outdoors and, and achieve the things you want to achieve. Optimising your mindset. Wow. Oh, my, my, that is a challenge and a half because, like, this is the thing, like, yeah, uh, like with a num like realms of distraction which live around us on a daily basis, optimizing one's mindset is a challenge, uh, because whew, it, uh, the challenges which come up, you never know. But like with regards to yourself and challenges, I have to ask, being the adventurous type, what was like one of your more challenging moments out there in the realms of adventure? Yeah, um, there's a, a couple of spring to mind, and and it, you know, and, and this this is something quite important that I've realised about myself, and I try to convey it to others. Sometimes it's not the experience itself which is challenging, mm. but it's the anticipation of not measuring up, not being capable of bit or competent enough to go on the adventure, to go yeah. to the next level, and to importantly to be part of a community of people who are already doing that. So. Mm. I'll give a couple of examples. So um, in 2013, uh, I decided to go slightly next step in my mountaineering type of experience. And I, I went to Greenland on a, a ski mountaineering expedition. And it was, in my mind, it was it was kind of meant to be not quite the Ranul Fiennes pulling a sledge behind you, but it was sort of in that sort of realm. Um, and I remember, you know, it was like exciting in the build up to it. I, I went to the gym and trained up a bit just so I'd be a bit fitter. And as I got closer to the, the time of going, um, I discovered that it wasn't going to be this kind of group experience where everyone's mucking in together at the same sort of level. And, you know, we're getting guided around and you sort of learn and, and do a little bit of stuff beyond, slightly beyond your comfort zone. I, I learned that no one else was going. It was just going to be me. Um, and I was going to have a polar guide with me who was basically treating me, I guess, like, well, a client, but also someone who would be on their level. <laughs> and we had all these plans. We were going to climb things that had never been climbed and ski things that had never been skied, all this kind of stuff. And I suddenly they thought, I'm in the deep end here. Uh, I, how am I going to measure up to a polar guide who's been up Everest, who's skied to the South Pole, all this kind of stuff? And I suddenly started to to feel really nervous about it. It's really anxious. And I thought, that's 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 me already sort of stepping up without having kind of gone through the interim sort of process. And you know what? Once I got there and realized I've done preparation, I've done an experience in other realms before, mm. it's just like context I'm not familiar with. And and I've built it up in my own mind you know, the expectations of that and, oh, how will I measure up? I'm not a polar explorer. Well, you know, over a few days camping out in the wild with this this chap out in the back of beyond in minus 30, <laughs> um, 
I kind of realized once I got over those nerves and anxiety and, you know, I was treated as an equal. I, I was quite capable, very capable of, of operating in that environment, you know. So I think in my part of the lesson there is that I, I tend to undersell where I'm, what I've done before and, and then worry about the unknown. But that's part of the adventure mindset. You kind of step into the unknown and it is a bit of a bold maneuver. Otherwise, you're just doing something, you know exactly how you're going to do it and it's no, no real challenge. And and the funny thing, and as a, a caveat to this, I actually got frostbitten toes when I was out there, which was <clears throat> put a bit of a dampener on the uh, the experience. Uh, but you know, I, I get I got to hang about with all these polar explorers for a couple more weeks, and and uh, actually they 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 kind of embraced me as one of their own, and the fact I had the the war wound as well, it was kind of added to the story. So so there's. You know, you said about what what's what's been a, a real challenge, and it was the challenge of stepping up into that that new kind of situation, that unknown. And it, but and, and I won't lie, it was a very tough experience, and it was probably the toughest thing I've ever done. Mm. But in my mind, it wasn't the physical toughness; it was the anticipation of am I going to be good enough, or am, am I going to come across like a dead weight to these people? because you need to be competent, you know, to be in that environment. Mm. So that was one one experience. Another experience in a completely different realm was when I, I went to Russia in, I think it was 2009, to learn to dive under ice, scuba dive under ice. So I did an ice diving scuba course. And it was a similar type of experience because, again, I thought I was going on a nice trip with lots of other people. I make a few new friends on all this kind of stuff. And we'd all speak English and all this, and we'd know what you know. We'd all learn together. That wasn't the case. <laughs> I, I, I flew out to um, northern Finland, and then I, I had instructions in garbled message on this from this company I'd been dealing with, saying someone would meet me meet me there the next morning. So I was in a hotel, and the next morning this chap appeared in a, a battered white van and had my name misspelt on the sign. Uh, while I was having breakfast, and I figured this was the chap I'm going with, and I'm like, where's everyone else? And he didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Russian. <laughs> and and I was kind of not bundled in the van, but it, it kind of felt a bit that way. I was like, where am I going now? And we drove several hours across the border to Russia, went to a, a compound with all these uh, customs people who were very stern. And and this this was in the winter as well, so everywhere's covered in snow. You know, the forest is full of snow. And eventually I ended up on this this tiny little kind of collection of buildings on the, the edge of this frozen sea right up in the north of Russia and spent that week learning to dive under ice with not really much instruction in English and all these people who were expert at ice diving. And I remember thinking to myself, as I walked into this place, I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? You know, how am I going to cope with this? Uh, why do I get myself into these situations? And um, and it was that same thing, you know, but once you settle into it, realise you've you've done the hard work stepping up into the unknown mm. and then you realise you know, you're drawing the experiences you've got and you have a, you know, you have a challenge mindset. You, you kind of step into the challenge and go, oh, okay, let's deal with this and let, let's see where we go from here. And and again, I, and I made some friends. I, I, I couldn't understand what any of them said, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a, a fantastic experience that I, you know, I've cherished, and uh, and since then I've done many things like that, where you're like, oh, to hell with it, step into the unknown. What's the worst can happen? Well, <laughs> there can be quite a few bad things could happen, but you know, <laughs> it's it's hard. Hard. what's the worst thing you can happen? I look, yeah, you know what, uh, frostbite, freezing, drowning. Yeah, no, there's a there's a there's a plethora of things which can go wrong. But like this is the thing, like what, like with regards to anything like that, people always assume it's the like physical, which is the mm -hmm. thing which will be the greatest challenge of all. And I've spoken to people who've done crazy things, been in special forces and stuff like this. You can have like you could have the most a uh, super Chad like Captain America type person run out and go yes i'm going to do this and more times than not they're the ones who like fail because their mind is not there it's that they are they're 
they're open to doing it, but they are not prepared to how uncomfortable it might actually take him to like those sort of dark places. Uh, mm-hmm. It might go, and you're like, oh, dark places. Look, if look, you're out in the snow, it's minus 30. And yeah, you're, you're going along with, okay. Like some guy who's like, going, yeah, it's an easy day. And yeah, many expletives will most probably be said under your breath because, hey, you can't say it to his face. But it's a place where only like a few miles that way, there's a nice warm cabin where I could be having a cocoa. And yeah, so many people will be like, I'm going to have that cocoa rather than sort of step into that challenge, you know? Yeah, but but yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the people who are accomplished are often the ones who are the quiet. Well, not all quiet, but sometimes it's the they just get on with it. They're not crowing about what they do. Mm. They're doing it, you know. And the people who are often, or sometimes the people who are loud about it, and I've done this, I've done that. You know, sometimes you put them in situations, and and they they're trying to, I guess, control the situation in a situation where the variables can't be controlled and then they don't know how to, to cope with that. Whereas I've always found with this kind of adventure mindset where you go in there, or I personally go in there, kind of almost, am I good enough to be here? And then relax into it and realise, you know, a humble attitude can sometimes really help you. I mean, it can hold you back as well and you sometimes need to put yourself out there more. Um, but that's that's all part of the learning experience of, of doing things and, Getting comfortable in the uncomfortable, I guess. Mm. No, no, no. There's times where you've got to give yourself a good old talking to. Like when I was doing the London Marathon uh, last year, like I was like, okay. Like I was ticking along and like, yeah, like it, oh, oh, Dave, it got good to me. Really <laughs> got good to me. I'm like, yeah, cruising, like coming, I go, oh yeah, great. First three miles, no problem. Smile on my face. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Six miles in, yeah. Look, oh, look, oh, there's the cutty sock. People all around the guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, mile 13. Uh, like, yeah, feet started to rub. And like, yeah, it was like, I, ah, ha, 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 ha. Like, I went from, like, I was on course for having a sub five hour time. I was like, okay. Like, going, okay, no worries. But. Had to give myself a talking to because it was like okay um like when i did the lemon and spa half marathon oh when i got to the 13 mile mark and like i was training all of this i wasn't i didn't train as much as i should have in the like for the lemon and spa half marathon and oh my lord i got to tw- like i got to the 12th mile running was out not an option it was just like yeah walk jog slightly walk Dog slightly there. Yeah. Last 200 meters, I was like, yeah, crawled myself across the line. I couldn't do that at the London Marathon. I still had a good 13 miles to go. So I was like, okay, right. Come on now. You're here doing the London Marathon. You're Look, you're like, you're not Mo Farah. You're not out to win this thing. You're out to take part in it and get it done. So I was like, okay, take off the gas enjoy the moment and like yes yeah do my tank trundle thing until i got to the end but i think it's like if i didn't like if i didn't go through those past experiences like going okay i have experienced this level of discomfort i've experienced this sort of level of pain Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no i would have been like yeah uh yeah i took part in the london marathon did you finish I got halfway through, then I had to quit. And I didn't want that to be like my story. I would, even if I had to walk, I would have like done that cleanup crew just on my heels. I was like, ah, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's amazing what we have expectations about something. And if the world doesn't conform to expectations, mm. and it's parts of the brain start kicking in, which take energy, and that's a, that's an arduous thing to then sort of resolve the fact that the world doesn't conform to what we had in mind. So sometimes having that those preconceptions can can hold us back because we don't know how to deal with it. Uh, you know, when when the reality hits, mm. uh, I, I remember um, in, the, in the gym many years ago, and there was this chap, and it was just me and this chap, 
And, and he was just quite a small chap. And, you know, he, he suddenly collapsed on the floor and his leg, oh, my leg, oh, my leg. I'm like, oh, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I was trying to, like, calm him down. Oh, my leg, oh, it's got this spasm, oh. And I said, is, is it not just cramp? Oh, cramp, what's cramp, what's cramp? <laughs> Turned out he was having a cramp in his leg. Um, and he'd never had a cramp before, and, and it was the worst thing he'd ever had. Whereas I, I don't think I've ever been through a gym session without having cramp. <laughs> so you're kind of like, oh, I haven't had the cramp yet. Oh, when's the cramp coming? Oh, there's the cramp. Oh, great. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah, having, if you've never faced a situation, you kind of, you know, how can you prepare yourself really for that unknown? But having that challenge mindset, and this is something I talk about a lot, a challenge mindset is, is just seeing the unknown as an opportunity. Mm. Um, and realizing that there will be adversity and you will have some sense of suffering or some sense of discomfort. And that's basically your system kicking in going, okay, you've been in this optimal comfort zone, something called homeostasis, which is the kind of technical term. And the brain and the body likes to be in that comfort zone, that optimal state, that homeostasis. And then when you start to go uphill, you know, on the mountain or whatever, and you start to get this sense of, oh, oh, this is a bit uncomfortable. Oh, my brain's telling me, oh, I'm tired. Should I turn back? Well, no, it's just your kind of brain and body are telling you, well, okay, we're now moving into a slightly different uh, situation where the energy resources need to be upped. So we're telling the brain, the body's telling the brain, we're about to release some more energy to help you change to the next gear. But often I think that's the, the time when people – think that they're at their limits but actually no they're they're at a a change of state in the mind and body and sometimes you need to you know you need to warm up and then get into your exercise and then activate these other energy systems to then start being in the zone where you're actually flying along and and you know doing the work so so there's, there's all these interesting mechanisms going on in the brain when you start to understand what's going on and then you tell yourself that Okay, this isn't me at my limit. This is me changing gear. Let's go with that. Let, let's see where it takes us next. So I, I like to encourage people when I'm taking them in the mountains, you know, when they're like, oh, well, this is as far as I was going to go. I think should we should have turned back now. And I'm, I'm saying, well, the view up there is amazing. Well, yeah, but I'm starting to feel tired. Oh, your, your system's now telling you you're about to be releasing more energy. You'll feel great if you keep going. And it's, you know, it's keeping encouraging people. It's like the carrot and the donkey. <laughs> and, uh, but this is where you're going to change into that extra system and you'll get so much more from doing that. So this is the kind of challenge mindset, you know, um, and it has a physiological effect. You know, having a challenge mindset can actually change the the parts of the, the stress response to release more energy. And that's the difference between seeing something as a challenge or deciding it's, and a threat is like, oh, oh, what's that? I, I don't want to encounter that. That's telling me to turn around and run away. Well, your system prepares to run away. And it's a psychological choice in, in a lot of cases to appraise that situation as a challenge, something I can rise to. You know, I can step up and, and approach this obstacle and, and climb over it <laughs> as opposed to turning back because it's a threatening thing which is telling me to, to bugger off, you know, so... There's yeah. some interesting mechanisms going on, and when you understand that, it can be helpful. Yeah, no, there's this former Navy SEAL called David Goggins. I yeah. Don't know if heard him. Yes. He often like goes, yes, like human beings like only go at sort of 40% of their true potential. And like, you know what I mean? They don't really sort of push themselves to go beyond that. It, <laughs> it's one of those things which I think rings so true because when like when you think about it, when people truly have got their backs against the wall and it's like, okay, if you want to get to like that next place, you've got to like step up and represent. There is no sort of like surrendering to like that moment of like, okay, I can quit here. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like people be amazed at what they can do, you know? Yeah, and you know, and, and it's something else just sprung to mind uh, when he asked me about challenge, and and mm. this this was something really, I guess, held me back in some respects. Um, breathing, 
<laughs> so funny thing to talk about. But, but um, breathing and, and being underwater. And I know there's there's a conflict <laughs> going on there, but scuba diving. So when you're scuba diving, you're obviously taking the, the kit down underwater. And mm-hmm. sometimes that, that's quite a challenge to people who've never done it before. And it was to me. And that first moment when you learn to scuba dive in a pool, uh, maybe kneeling in the pool in the shallow end, and you, you take the thing and you're told to duck your head under the water. And it's so alien to have this regulator in your mouth. Mm. and not be breathing through your nose and some people and i don't know how true this is but apparently if you're the type of person who does that and then panics and then comes to the surface and won't won't just stick it out for a few breaths i think there's a there's a a large potential chance you will never do scuba diving again so it's down to that moment of choice can you just go with it now as you get more into your scuba diving career and get into more more extreme situations shall i say you get into a habit of needing to change your regulators or you, there are drills you do where you, you if you're, if one of your regulators runs dry, one of your tanks runs dry, you've got to swap and you've got to turn things on and off. This is called technical diving. And I've done quite a bit of that uh, in the past uh, as well. And then um, although I went down that route quite far into that more extreme side of diving, I realised that I had a real panic thing to do with taking a regulator out underwater. I mean, we're talking quite deep here as well. And then swapping to the other. And it's a very basic thing. And, you know, I could do it, but I was doing it in a very panicky sort of way. And and where I kind of had a bit of a breakthrough, I went on what's called a stress course, an underwater stress course. And it's, it's, it's kind of an entry into, ultimately, into cave diving. And I didn't go all the way down the whole process, but I did the first few days of, of an introduction to cave diving type of course. Mm-hmm. And to many people, and probably to myself, it's one of the most terrifying things you could do, cave diving, or to do all the, the, the training for it as well. Because now you, you're you doing training where your your instructor is also sort of getting you to turn, you know, putting you in stressful positions. You're turning your air supply off, you're breathing it dry, you're swapping your regulators with one hand, you're trying to keep hold of a line, which is your lifeline in the, of a cave. And, and you know, early on in the, the, the several days course, I realised that my approach that I've been using so far of panic, sort of panicking and doing this and swapping my regulators wasn't going to work. And I had a real stressy time for a couple of days where I was trying to get my head around the fact and, and, you know, the, the instructor was very good. He, he said to me, look, you can easily hold your breath for 10 seconds. And that's what you need to do when you swap your regulators initially, before we're getting the real stressy sort of side things. Yeah. And and I, I took this on board and, and I just tried to take my regulator out, holding my breath for a few seconds, putting it back in. And I, I prolonged it. I did a couple of seconds. And then I found I could do it for 10 seconds. And then I found I could swap the two. So when it came to doing the actual live scenario, which is really stressful, I kind of enjoyed it (laughs) because (laughs) I'd suddenly realised after all these years of sort of having this total limiting, panicky belief about holding my breath Mm. and doing this kind of thing and panicking, that actually there was a moment of pause, a moment of calm almost when you do it. And time almost seems to slow down because now you're in that, semi-meditative sort of capacity where you can control your response and in one of the most dire sort of potential situations underwater with no air and and it was just a you know it might sound like I'm overblowing it a bit but to my mind that was massive because suddenly I actually found a positive in having no regulator in and putting it back in and having that capacity to to hold my breath briefly and all it is is a kind of moment of pause. And I think this is important in our stressed out lives where we're constantly, if we're not trying to juggle all these tasks, we're, we're scrolling up through Instagram, which is not great. But if you can take that moment of pause, and it might be 10 seconds, it might be 10 minutes, or it might just be a few minutes, whatever, just that kind of almost moment of breathlessness, for want of a better term, that can really help us just stop, evaluate, no stress for that moment, and then go back into what we're doing. And it's quite good to discipline yourself to do that from time to time, and it can really help you reset and then get back on the you know the 
the juggling the demands or whatever but it's it's important to have that moment of pause and that that moment of, of breath holding um so that's yeah that's that's one of this sort of insights i would bring from doing a kind of extreme sport Ooh. saying well you can take these concepts and then apply them in your everyday life and, and you need to weave them into your life you can't just do it like once when the mood takes you like oh i've told you about it now let's do it once and then forget about it and go back to your stressy life you know if you can just do little moments here and there you'll find the stack up um and it, and it really helps you know train that mechanism if you like i hear you i hear you now speaking of moments now what moments do you want to seek out in your future journey with it all? Yeah, well, um, I did a bass jump last year. I did a tandem bass jump, which was actually the one of the first tandem bass jumps in the UK. And you know what? That was That's interesting because I had spent several years watching other people doing this and being right on the edge when they do it and thinking I had a good sense of what it's like to do it until I did it, and then I, I kind of didn't want to do it. <laughs> like, oh, now we've got to step up and actually do it. But you know what? As soon as I jumped off the cliff and sort of didn't die <laughs> and the parachute opened and we, the two of us landed, I was like, I need to do that again. I need to do it right now. So I'd love to do more of that, maybe in more exotic places, maybe in more grandiose settings or whatever. Um. So uh, there's something very addictive about, about that. Um, I was learning the paraglide last year, which was going to be my sort of foray into doing aerial type of sports. And paragliding is a lovely thing in itself. It's, it's quite an extreme activity in itself. But it's, there's something about when you run off a hill uh, with a, a piece of nylon above you, which might sound a bit dubious, <laughs> and you start catching the wind and, and floating and you're piloting your own craft, if you like, that's that's amazing. Um, it's that I think moments which encompass things like that appeal to me because it's me against the elements and and I'm kind of in control but in in harmony with the elements and, and there's something profound. I, and I do see this as a kind of a meditative, almost a spiritual thing. Um, again, it might sound a bit corny or cliché, but I find calm in often these kind of you know, extraordinary uh, places and, and, and activities. So I'd like to do more of that. Um, there's some other stuff I'm, I'm looking to get into, but basically I'm trying to get myself out more and talk about this. So doing this kind of podcast is great for that, but doing, I do motivational speaking. So spreading the message, getting people into that adventure mindset. Um, that that really empowers me and, you know, really fires me up as well because other people get that, the enthusiasm and they want to get involved. I'm not, I'm not saying everyone needs to do base jumping or paragliding or whatever. But just getting more adventurous and getting out in the hills and, and experiencing nature. That, that's what I'm all about. And those are the kind of moments I'm trying to string together into a continuum, you know. Wow, brilliant, brilliant. What would be one great adventure you would love to do in the next, say, two years, like two, three years? Oh, there's so many things I could do. Um, it's funny because I've not been abroad since COVID. So I'd like to get back abroad somewhere to do something quite exotic. Now, one place I've always had in my bucket list is Antarctica. And I'm not sure it's going to happen in the next two years, but I've always wanted to go to Antarctica, to the south. Um, I'd love to ice dive in Antarctica, funny enough. <laughs> Which was sort of on the cards a while ago, but... Um, you know, there's so much, so many places out there. Um, there's some stuff that I'm kind of working on with the team of, of extreme sports people I'm in, I'm involved with called Mountain Man Base. Um, there's some, some kind of cool stuff where we're trying to get together some projects on a slightly bigger scale. I can't really go into that right now. Oh. <laughs> just, just to tease oh. what, um, what's this place. Um, but, you know, doing more of these adventurous things in... Some some of the amazing places we have on the planet, uh, as well as you know in the UK. Um, so I hope to get more up to Scotland uh, in the forthcoming months because there's pretty much nowhere on earth like Scotland, really. Uh, you know, homegrown kind of place like Scotland's amazing. There's so much to do up there, uh, and I I live near North Wales as well, which is my stomping ground. And it's it's stunning, especially going into spring. So there's there's loads of adventures. I'll be dangling off cliffs. I'll be taking people into the mountains, you know, as part of what I do. 
and I'll be getting involved in the extreme sports type of stuff. Um, and doing all the science and research which goes with that uh, and, and you know spreading that message about that, that that's that's really part of the passion as well oh, love it love it North Wales like hey look, Land Didlo uh, like yeah um, yeah did a little bit of Snowden myself so you know what I mean so yeah, yeah just that just going up the mountain but I'll tell you this Snowden is such a busy place you wouldn't think it but it's quite a busy place. Wow. It's full of influencers now taking selfies and, and fighting each other for the perfect photo, which has gone a bit far in my opinion. Oh, a second. Look, look, look. I, I won't lie. Like there, was, like, there was a picturesque scene. Yeah. Where, like, like, I had a picture taken. I had to do it. I was I was just a mere basic tourist. <laughs> Well, no, it's beautiful mountain, um, and and this is the thing. I mean, people tend to gravitate to the the specific routes which everyone knows about, but there's so many routes you can go up a mountain like Snowdon, and that's the sort of thing I take people off off the beaten track, you know. And, and that's a great metaphor, I believe, as well. Um, you know, we can chase these summits, we can head head for that summit, but we we get turned back and we keep going along the same path. Well, I I often branch off and go off a different path. And then, you know, eventually you find you've mapped out the whole mountain or you've mapped out a different route. And then people start following you up that route and they're like, oh, right, there's, there's more to the mountain and there's more to life, of course, than the set path. And I guess that's the message I, I tend to spread. Um. <laughs> I'm loving your, I'm loving your enthusiasm for it all, sir. Loving your enthusiasm. Like, look, I, there are times where I would simply like, oh, yes, like, what are you grateful for? And like, yeah, what brings you gratitude? Like, I know the sense of adventure brings you, like, gives you gratitude. But like, yeah, what was the last thing you were grateful for? Um, I was grateful for being invited on this podcast. That's when. <laughs> uh, yes, as no, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful when people get where I'm coming from, and you know, and and get opportunities to talk about it and get people. To come along and, and experience the sort of environments I go on, and that and that's that's profound to me because you know I'm doing something I love, and what what's what can you be more grateful for in life than if you're doing something you genuinely love, and you're getting other people excited about it, and, and you you know you're putting something back out there. So that's yeah, I mean just just getting any opportunities, which I've, I've got a few of late, you know doing things like podcasts and I've got some talks coming up and I'm grateful to, to be able to spread the message and, and and really try and fire everyone else up and get them on their life purpose in the same way that I've been very fortunate to be able to to get my own life in that direction as well. Oh, brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> I, yes, I have I have no more questions to ask. I have I've run out of it all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, would I say I'm talked out? No, no, no that would <laughs> never happen. Never in this lifetime. But, but let me just say, uh, yeah. Dave, thank you for coming on today. You have been a star, a, a delight, you. a pleasure to have. Yes, making me feel lazy as well. Kind of Wait, come out with me. You should go up soon. We should have an adventure. Do a, I, a, a live podcast, well, not a live, but a, a podcast up the mountain. You know, uh, I've thought of doing that before. You know what? I would say yes, but the wind up on that frigging mountain is yeah. insane. <laughs> need a directional microphone which can cut out the wind noise, I suppose. Yeah. Go up the mountain, come down the mountain, and yeah, do the podcast in a nice pub, uh, yeah. like with a pint in hand. I'll definitely be up for that. Before and after, yeah, the, the benefits before and after, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you tell the lovely people where they can find you out on these interwebs? Right. So I call myself Cognitive Explorer, and you can find me online, cognitiveexplorer.co.uk. Uh, you can put my name, Dave Gallagher Adventure, Dave Gallagher Psychology. You can put many things into the internet and find me because I'm pretty uh, accessible there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, anyone who's interested to get in touch, you can get through the website. Um, and like I say, I can take people in the outdoors or I can go into organisations and talk about what I do and do inspirational speeches and 
I'm trying to get involved in some events, some bigger sort of outdoor type of events as well and, and get on that circuit and, and showcase what I do. But no, um, cognitiveexplorer.co.uk is the best place to find me. Um, and you'll find I've published quite a lot of pictures on base jumping. I've been in the newspapers. So there's quite a lot of stuff online you can find with my name on it. Uh, you know, um, that's, that's it, yeah. So look forward to connecting more with the wider community of people who can benefit from this. Ah, brilliant. Yes. Yes, you lovely people out there. Yeah, find Dave. Get in contact with him. Uh, he might, like, be careful. He might trick you into, like, doing some type of adventure. Like, I can see in his eyes. Like, I've already, I've, I can foresee myself on Snowden <laughs> on a cold, wet day. <laughs> You'll be loving it. You'll be loving the challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dave, once again, thank you for coming on to the podcast today. Absolute delight, pleasure. Ah, no worries. And hey, I'd like to thank you, my friends, my life warriors, for sticking with us to the end of the show. Ha <laughs> ha. Please stay well, stay safe, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic, be all the positive bees you can be in this world and then some. Hey, have a great one, my friends. Peace. And we are out. No, we're not.